you and introduce ourselves. So I'm DJ Lee and I am a uh, professor at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. And um, I write about wilderness and I write creative nonfiction, a little bit of fiction and scholarship on um, environmental history. And I'm also an oral historian. Hi there. I'm Petra Kappas. I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. I teach in performance studies and in disability studies, and I'm a poet and a fiction writer and mainly a performance artist and a community artist. And all these identities are part of why we're doing what we're doing today. Okay. So uh, from mid-December 2019 to April 2020, Petra and I were the editors of an issue of the Eco-Poetic Journal About Place, which is sponsored by the Black Earth Institute. We called for work in the lineages of solar punk, entanglement discourses, and infrastructural questions of how to do things in turbulent times. The work in our Practices of Hope issue showcases creative processes as ways of making change and bringing people together. So some of the questions we asked our uh, submitters were, how can creative practice allow us to feel and act differently? How can we invent new appreciation of and new embodiment practices for humans and other fellow creatures? What can speculative and non-realist -real forms mean and how can we make them resonate for eco-arts? As artists and writers in our journal demonstrate, um, and as our current viral times make clear, we can't afford purely apocalyptic and dystopian fantasies. We need art that activates new relationships to embodiment, climate crisis, species extinction, uh, racial justice, environmental and environmentally located social pressures. So how can we imagine a different future with more of us in it? Um, and that's the, the, the kind of central question of the, the pieces that we finally selected for the journal. And the people who came together in the journal included poets and visual artists who shared visions and soundscapes, videos and performance remnants that showed new imaginations at work in hard times. So during our editing process, which spanned over many months and which included work with our two assistant editors, Rachel Sanchez and Catherine Fairfield, we also found com comrades who worked in the aftermath of viral lives like MacArthur and his futurist Detroit and aid where an AIDS infection fantasy uh, has created a virus that has a new valency field. It gives this new um, HIV virus has given new powers to people who have it. Another example of what we found was um, a Black, Life, Black Lives Matter activist and mad trans artist, Cyrus Marcus Ware from Toronto, who created an, uh, an out of space living in a white supremacist world. He moved to Antarctica. He's, he created this uh, installation of a future Antarctic settlement in which a new kind of vision of a more socially just world can develop but along the way, he's asking a lot of questions. He's asking a lot of questions of what it might mean to create utopia. So it's a fabulously interesting um, installation and play text that you can look at in our journal. Hong Kong-based performance artist Kanta Kocha Lindgren calls us to a practice of the house on my back. She reinvents the tempest with an Afro-Asian futurism of migrations and connections. And lastly, another, another example that we wanted to bring to you is poet and linguist Margaret Newton roots herself in Ojibwe land and language when she reminds us, this place remembers us. So this is the piece we're now going to share with you. So please listen for three minutes to Margaret Newton read her poem to us. And I will start out uh, by just saying as a, a poet from within the Great Lakes who writes in our indigenous language Anishinaabe one, I find that it's fun to have people hear the language and have it kind of echo and, and resonate with folks, but sometimes people like to see it. So I will try 
to share the screen so you can see the words as I read them. I'll read it first in Anishinaabe Mwen, so you can enjoy that. I write all of the poems in Anishinaabe Mwen first, so my belief is that they sound better in that language because I've kind of been able to play with the rhythm and the resonance a different way, but uh, I will also read it in English as well. So I'll try and do that if I can do it correctly. And this was written specifically for this project, thinking about the place that we are in and what I feel about the space that I live in and how I might share the, the sense of being there. Gememe egonan oma, bidabang ani bongi shimon, geme wang ani gaki jewang, gedayang wa megonan, zeganaguak, zibens gedamang, manidok, Manidun sika zawat. Ganit dawagi agonan oma. Gishkabagwat gawandak. Ziga an doyang bingwak. Gamikwena megonan ishkwa. Nishadendamong. Nojimo adilzo yang. This place is our lullaby. Sunrise to sunset. Rainfall to waterfall. This place is our warning. Storm clouds and sorrow. Spirits in the smallest form. This place becomes us, thirst of the white spruce, baptism of the earth's ash. This place remembers us after we fall apart and then put ourselves back together. So I will stop sharing there, having given you a taste of the language from the Great Lakes. And I do feel as, as Peter mentioned, we are living through historic times. And for all of my black students and black colleagues, I have been teaching everyone to say, which is Black Lives Matter. And we just need to keep saying it. So thank you very much. Okay. Right. Um, that's just, that was just a wonderful um, opening to the reading that we had last Friday. And we are going to continue to have readings out of the journal for the next three months. And Petra and I also taught a, a solar punk hybrid making workshop and, and uh, Margaret Newton's poem was the opening piece that we used. Um, on that note um, of hope and change and coming together, Petra, I was wondering if you could tell me and tell the audience of Humanities on the Brink, what attracted you to um, Practices of Hope? Thank you. So Practices of Hope has so many meanings in my life. And I'm gonna take us first right now to my wedding. So <laughs> a few years back, I got married to my wife, Stephanie Hyde, who's also a poet and a dancer. And we knew that we wanted to have a wedding that was very much about practices of hope and it was about community creation. So we married in our backyard and um, we had created a range of rituals for ourselves. And at the core of these rituals was, um, you know, the moment when the bride and the bride get greeted by their community, right? So we had a, a ritual walk. We um, gave everybody at the beginning of the walk a little card which asked them for their practices of hope. Would they be so kind to think about what their practices of hope are? And would they then please do that practice of hope after our wedding is over as a way of bringing those energies forward? We gave them that card. And then as part of them, them thinking about this, we had them walk from the backyard to the front of the house where there's a peace pole. And that peace pole had the four languages that are really important to Stephanie and myself, which is English, Spanish, these are the two languages Stephanie speaks, my native German, and then also an Ojibwe language, Odawa, which is the origin of where this pole came from and also the land on which I'm coming to you right now. So those four languages are on the pole. So the whole procession, the whole wedding community went around the pole then came back into the, into the backyard and then told everybody, us, the two of us, as they were greeting us, something about their practices of hope. So that was the beginning of where this, this, this word, this phrase had so much resonance to me. And I used that little moment of our wedding to speak about what, to, to me, community performance is about. So I have this book called Community Performance and Introduction, which is a, sort of a textbook that many people use to think about 
how community performance works and how one can set up work with people in the community. And so that example is at the heart of that. And it also connects in other ways for me with important moment in my own uh, biography, including Ernst Bloch and his, um, the, the kind of principle of hope that, that he writes about. You know, someone who's from the same kind of time period as the Frankfurt School, but someone who never really turned away from the utopian, the positive aspect of what hope in cultural making can be. He hadn't a, a naive or highly positive image of culture can make everything better, but he constantly believed in that when people come together and envisage change, not as an endpoint, but always as a process, that that is what the principle of hope is. And that was to me the basis of what we've been trying to do with this collection, to bring people together and to be in process together, not to arrive at some utopia, that's ridiculous in these times, but to be on a journey together and to be in a journey together playfully. I think that's what we're trying to do here. And now I'm gonna ask you a question. Can you speak to us a little bit about how does community building manifest for you? Um, okay, thanks, Petra. Um, yeah, I, I also want to take everybody back to a moment which happened about three or four years ago. I was hiking the East Coast Trail of uh, Newfoundland, uh, Canada. It's the easternmost trail in, in the whole North American continent. Uh, it was my father and my mother, my husband, my nephews from my husband's side and my side, family friends. Um, and so we started at St. John and we worked our way up to the north, up north, and then we um, drove back down. And so I ended up back at that wonderful museum in St. John, Newfoundland. And the, I stumbled upon in the bookstore, uh, Pam Hall's Encyclopedia of Local Knowledge. And it was the most wonderful book that I'd ever seen in my life. And since I had been tromping through the wet, um, <laughs> marshy landscape of Newfoundland, it really spoke to me. And one of her goals is to expand how we think about what knowledge is and who's invited to participate in its production. And we all know that the traditional you know, way that has been handed down is that there are these keepers of knowledge in universities and governments, and they're the ones that decide how we can all relate to one another. But if we build that knowledge from the ground up, from the people who live closest to the land and who live in communities together, and that their knowledge is just as important and, or actually more important than the, the great decision makers, that is what's going to give us the modes and a means for, for moving forward. Here's just a, one example of um, the hundreds of plates that she made with these local people in Newfoundland. Um, they use a lot of rope and twine in their fishing that they do off the northern coast in the Change Islands. And so many of them know just so much about rope. They know more about rope than anyone else in the world, practically. And so she collaborated with them to make this piece of art, but also it's very practical. Like, here is how you splice a, a piece of rope. You know, here's what mooring is. Here's how you tie certain knots. And she has hundreds of these plates. You know, some of them are collaborations between local knowledge and um, federal agencies. So you have the local ecological knowledge and then the fisheries ecological knowledge. And they can collaborate and, and actually, you know, make change happen in ways that, that just one or the other um, alone can't. A lot of the, see, a lot of the contributors in our journal did collaborative work. They either collaborative, collaborated with other people um, or they just collaborated with themselves. So for example, um, <clears throat> Regina Young's Carbon Glow, where she she collaborates in some ways with herself and with the environment and with using different forms. And a lot of our pieces, the artists and writers, they're breaking out of those traditional um, 
spaces in ways that we think of a lit even as of a literary journal. Um, and the piece that I just love in that vein is Megan Kaminsky and L. Ann Wheeler's piece, um, The Prairie Divination Deck. Uh, I think it makes excellent use of local knowledge. They're collaborating with the environment. They're collaborating with one another. They're using technical um, skills. They're using hand drawing, but they also do um, uh, uh, digital animation. So they are just taking that community and that collaboration to all these wonderful places. And you'll see that now as we play um, a little bit of Megan's um, reading in our uh, Practices of Hope series um, from last Friday. Um, so I'm going to share um, one of the entries um, from the collection, the uh, Prairie Divination Deck that Leslie Ann Wheeler and I are collaborating on. It's a work in progress, but we were so excited by Petra and DJ's call for work for the Practices of Hope issue and thought specifically about the entry of Pussy Toes being appropriate. Um, so just a teeny bit of background about the deck. Um, we're hoping that it might be a starting point for encounter that encourages further engagement with the more than human inhabitants um, with which we share our lives. And in doing that, that it can help build practices that might counter extractive and exploitative relationships with the earth and with each other. So a lot of these relationships that we think of as natural, but are really um, rooted in uh, colonizing values, so kind of thinking about that as a starting point for a different kind of relationship. Um, I mean, there are lots of starting points. For anyway, um, that's what we were thinking, and I'm going to share the video. Um, Leslie made this really wonderful time-lapse video of the creation of uh, the Pussy Toast card, so I'm going to play that while I read the entry. Pussy toes. Antenaria plantagini folia and Antenaria neglecta. Sometimes it feels like winter will never end. When looking into a frost line field or down at frozen puddles curbside as you cross the avenue, the wintry chill can easily spread from your bones into your mind. While this cold clarity makes room for reflection and restoration, the first green sprouts of spring signal the promise of new beginnings. Prairie pussy toes, also known as early everlastings, are one of the earliest blooming wildflowers in pastures and meadows. When they arrive in a field, others are close to follow. Pussy toes spoon shaped leaves are covered in silver gray hairs and the white or light pink puffy ovals of their flowers resemble the tender paws of cats. The pussy toe provides pollen for bees and is host for the American painted lady butterfly caterpillar. When this card comes into your life, it signals that new growth is on the way. Maybe you've been experiencing a period of dormancy or are ready for a change. Keep faith, something is about to begin. This is also a reminder to treat your new starts tenderly, nurture them and welcome them into the world. How can you hold space for this growth? What bright new things are about to bloom within you and through your care? Thank you. Let's finish with a last piece from our contributors and a last piece from our reading. We're going to end with Sydney Epps, Nina Taught Me, which again is a piece that is grounded in the kind of cultural formations of where people come from. So both DJ and I spoke about our own backgrounds and Sydney speaks about listening to Nina Simone and using the music and the sound as a way into her piece which grounds us in a way of understanding relations between earth, spirit, 
and words in a different way. So we're going to end on this one with a shout to Black Lives Matter as well. And uh, thank you for listening and please enjoy Sydney Epps. I wrote this in 2014, I believe. Um, it was right after Eric Gardner's um, death in New York City. Um, and that was the gentleman who was choked out by a police officer. Um, and I believe that is where the sentiment of I can't breathe being a part of the Black Lives Matter movement began. But this all very much tied to experiences of um, discrimination and reaffirming oneself and one's community through understanding that the natural given essence of one's being is not what is on, um, what is hated, but it is tied to a instability, a jealousy, a, um, a worry of really admitting to historical sins that we all are involved in and that we continue to perpetuate because we don't want to face um, various truths about our histories and our realities. So with that being said, um, this title Nina taught me is an ode to uh, Nina Simone, a, an activist, a beautiful singer and um, writer in her time. And if you know the song that this is tied to, um, to be young, gifted, and Black, there are lines within it that are interwoven and played with throughout the poem. So with that being said, let's begin. Is it a sin in this skin? <laughs> no, it is a blessing. See, the best teacher I had was this rap, gifting a knowledge more potent than college, a test that got y'all shook. People of color got books of this real accounting mounting. Emotional intelligence became, <sighs> relevant when I realized the problem wasn't me. The girl, <laughs> the girl is good, but I'm not better because I left the hood and this climb brought new insight. Gave me the experience to see through various eyes <laughs> the pile of lies in which we've uncovered. The battered bodies of police threats were all targets, even them. Because if we pull out of the Middle East, how else is a veteran supposed to eat? All lives can't matter if oil is the entity. No more clans sets or gangs necessary because we know where our enemy lives and recluse. We are the 99 left behind. Together we can't lose because the minor minority here, it ain't in the whole Geronimo, Carl, and Audrey said so. And the fam that we ran with knew all truth. Yet we stopped lifting, we stopped reading, and the fact left with the right. So now McGraw Hill makes the heroes straight, cis, and white. And the public schools leak, segregationists creep. Get your vouchers, get your ass on the train away from Brown, get on board. We're shutting down miscegenation station. Gerrymandering ain't enough to shut them up. With this skin, I have learned to live in harmony. <laughs> the best of me is dark. And yet still seen. Superior is pale, 
is the tale the rest learn. But charcoal under pressure makes a diamond the best learn. I kiss no bums. I am no bum. And no creams, I need to have fun in this sun. I am one with this sun. I am one with him, sun. Active yet unmoved, I am earth. She is the ground that I am rooted in. I am not above her in any way. I am with her in every way. That is, whew, that's some pragmatic magic. So the truth stays intact, yet under attack. I am blessed nonetheless for the access. I own codes they can't crack. <laughs> to be young, gifted, and Black. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, um, thank you so much for listening. And uh, below, we have a link to the journal and to the reading series. And we invite you to think about your own practices of hope that you're going to carry into the future. Perfect. OK. All right, we're good. <laughs> Thank you for